Hi, I'm Gal from Tel Aviv University, and this video is an invitation to free probability from the perspective of theory of computer science. You may have already encountered free probability in TCS, whether it is in the context of spectral graph theory or quantum information or quantum complexity or maybe something else. And you may have asked yourself, well, what is free probability? A common answer you may find is that free probability is an analog of regular probability, just that the random variables do not commute. This phrase may sound interesting or not, but it is not very informative in any case. If you dive a little deeper and you ask a researcher what is free probability, you will get an answer that is typically very technical and sometimes semi-apologetic. And indeed, what is available online is very comprehensive, but not necessarily very inviting to all audiences. So the goal of, of this video is to try to give the bare minimum of the basics of for probability, the basics needed for a specific application, and it is unavoidable that the talk will be technical, but hopefully not too technical. I will hint to connections between the between free probability and the application I'm going to talk about, but we'll, I will not prove anything. And the application we're going to focus on is an application in spectral graph theory, in particular, Ramanujan graphs. Let's set some background about spectral expanders. Having a graph G, it can be represented by its adjacency matrix A. And if the graph is undirected, the matrix is symmetric. So it has n real eigenvalues, which I can name lambda 1 to lambda n and sort them, n being the uh, number of vertices in the graph. And it is known that if the graph is uh, irregular, lambda 1 equals d, this is called the trivial eigenvalue of the graph, and lambda n is greater or equal than minus d. And in most applications, we would want d to be as small as possible, meaning we want the graph to be sparse. And there is this number, lambda of g, which I call the expansion of g, which is the max absolute value of all the non-trivial eigenvalues of the graph. And as it turns out, the smaller this number is, the better expansion properties the graph has. So, for instance, small sets expand, uh, uh, small sets expand, and random walks converge faster, and so on. And as we want this number to be as small as possible, and we want d to be as small as possible, this raises the question of what's the trade-off between the two. And the trade-off was answered by the alon bopana bound, telling us that lambda of g is greater or equal than this number here, 2 square root of d minus 1, minus another term that vanishes with the size of the graph. This means that if we look at the scale between minus d and d of possible values for eigenvalues of the graph, the case in which all the eigenvalues reside within minus and plus 2 square root of d minus 1, this would be the best case scenario for a graph. And graphs achieving this are called Ramanujan graphs. Our motivating example for this video is finding the expansion, finding the spectrum of a random graph. And we will look at the regular graph picked by the following distribution. I pick the independent perfect matching matchings on all the vertices. So in this instance, I have n equals 12 vertices and d equals 3. So I pick three independent perfect matchings on 12 vertices. And the eventual graph is the union of all the edges meaning that I place the perfect matchings on top of each other. In matrix form, 
this has the following form. I define the adjacency matrix AG to equal the sum of the individual matching matrices, where these matrices, if I look at the yellow matching on the left, and I focus on the vertices UV, which are connected by an edge, I'll have one in the corresponding locations UV and VU in the matrix. And again, the question is, what is the spectrum of this matrix AG? Let's take a different perspective on the same question. We start with the matrices MI, and I can easily calculate their eigenvalues. This MI has one with multiplicity n over two and minus one with multiplicity n over two as well. And if I think of the probability distribution, which is uniform over the eigenvalues, so I have n over two options to pick one, n over two options to pick minus one, Overall, I have one with probability half and minus one with probability half. And I think of this as the probability distribution corresponding to the matching I. And this would be the same distribution for all matchings. And now I think of the probability distribution over the, over the eigenvalues of the graph G. So instead of just asking what the eigenvalues are, I think of a probability distribution which is uniform over these values. And, the, and what I want to ask here is kind of a funny question. Can we write this distribution mu g as some operation over the individual distributions of the matrices. This distribution is either some kind of a sum or a convolution over probability measures. So can I write it this way in a manner that will make any sense and will be well-defined, but also will be insightful for us to answer the question of the spectrum of a random graph? And the answer is yes, otherwise I wouldn't make this video. And in order to show you this, I need to introduce the world of non-commutative probability spaces, non-commutative random variables, and in particular, free random variables. We'll start by defining a non-commutative probability space. A non-commutative probability space is composed of two elements an algebra A and a functional phi, where by algebra I mean a set with the operations of addition, multiplication by scalars, complex scalars, and multiplication of the elements of A, where the letter multiplication does not have to be commutative. I'll show an example soon. And phi is a function from A to the complex numbers that has to be unital, meaning that phi of the identity element equals one, and it is required to be linear. In this equation, alpha and beta are complex numbers. And as an example, we can think of A as being all the complex matrices of dimension N. And here I have the usual definition for matrix addition, multiplication, and multiplication by scalars. Note that matrix multiplication is indeed not commutative. And phi of a matrix is the normalized trace, the usual trace divided by the dimension of the matrix, where this is required to satisfy the uh, unital condition. For two elements in the algebra X and Y, we can define uppercase X and uppercase Y, to be the algebras generated by X and the identity and by Y and the identity. So in these algebras, in these subalgebras, I can have uh, addition, multiplication, and multiplication by scalars, but I just use the elements either X and I, X and the identity or Y and the identity. So for example, five X cubed plus eight times the identity is in the algebra uppercase X. 
and y minus 3y squared is in the algebra uppercase y. And we say that the elements x and y are free if the following condition holds. If I have a sequence of k elements in the algebra x and, y, and k elements in the algebra y, such that they are all centered, meaning that phi of all those elements equals zero, then phi of their product, where I take x's and then y's from, the, from both sequences, phi of the product is also zero. And this is the basic definition of freeness. Now, you may be a little confused here because I told you that this thing is called a non-commutative probability space. But where is the probability here? To answer this question, we think of phi of x, phi of x squared, phi of x cubed, and so on, as moments of a probability distribution which I call mu x. And this is the regular notion of a moment. So the kth moment would be the expected value of t to the k, where t is distributed according to this probability distribution mu x. And with this in mind, phi of this product of x's and y's is the joint moment of these elements. Now, if this is still confusing, let's think about something we're more familiar with, which is independent random variables. So if X and Y are independent random variables, then this joint moment over here, the expected value of the product of X and Y is the product of the expectations of X and Y. And also the expected value of X cubed Y squared XY which is a funny thing to write for random variables, which are numbers. This indeed equals the fourth moment of X times the third moment of Y. And such set of rules, which can be written down compactly for all joint moments, can be used to define what independent random variables are. And the definition we've seen for free random variables is an analog of that. With this analogy in mind, let's see how we can calculate the joint moments of X and Y being free random variables using the individual moments of X and Y. And we start by looking at the moment phi of X, Y. And in order to use the definition of freeness, I need to have elements that match the criteria of this definition on the left-hand side. In order to do so, I define the elements x0 and y0, which are the centered versions of x and y. So x0 is x minus phi of x times the identity. And notice that phi of x is just a complex number. And y0 is defined similarly. And now I have the elements matching the criteria of the definition. I have x0 and y0 in the respective algebras and both their uh, first moments are zero. They are centered. And now I use the definition of freeness to get that their joint moment, phi, phi of x0, y0 equals zero. How does this help me? Well, this also equals phi of x, y minus phi of x, phi of y, just by linearity of phi and the definition of x0 and y0, and moving things around, I get that the joint moment phi of xy, which I was looking for, equals phi of x, phi of y. Now you may think at this point that I've just done an excessive amount of work to get the exact same thing as we got for independent random variables. So am I just working really hard to redefine what independent random variables are. Well, let's see. We've seen that phi of x, y equals phi of x, phi of y. We can similarly, similarly show that phi of 
x, y, x equals phi of x squared times phi of y, which still suspiciously looks like independent random variables. And if these were indeed independent random variables under disguise, I would expect that phi of x, y, x, y equals the second moment of x times the second moment of y. However, this is not the case, but rather I get some, using the same method, I'll get a different result, which involves both, both the second moments of x and y, but also the first moments appearing here squared. And I see that I get here a result which is different from independent random variables. Now you may ask yourself, well, is this method of calculating the uh, joint moments of x and y, is it too complicated? Well, it kind of is, but when asking whether something is too complicated, we need to ask too complicated for what? What exactly are we trying to achieve? As for independent random variables, we may want to calculate their sum. So I defined an element in the algebra, which I denote by Z, to be the sum of the free random variables X and Y. And I denote its probability distribution mu z, which is the one we care about, and we want to express it as a function of the probability distributions mu x and mu y. And recall that mu z is defined by its moments, meaning that I want to be able to calculate all the moments of z given the moments of x and y. Let's see how this can be done. The first moment phi of z is phi of x plus phi of y by linearity of phi. There I didn't even need the fact that they are free. For the second moment, I, for writing down this term, I used the definition of freeness, or the calculations we've done using the definition of freeness, meaning that I was able to express the second moment of z in terms of the individual moments of x and y. And this can continue to tell me that indeed the moments of z depend separately on the moments of x and y, meaning that this can be written down as a well-defined operation on probability distributions. However, this does not yet give me a shortcut for how to calculate this probability distribution. So do we have any trick to calculate this probability distribution? We have reset our goal into calculating the probability distribution mu z of the sum of two free random variables x and y. And I will now denote this symbol over here as the free additive convolution of mu x and mu y. And again, we assume that x and y are free. And for simplicity, I will assume that they are identically distributed by a probability distribution, which I denote by mu. In this instance, I can rewrite mu z as mu squared, where the power is with respect to this free additive convolution. And here comes into play one of the main theorems of free probability theory, which is a theorem by Voiculescu, the founder of the field. And this says that the R transform of Z equals the R transform, the sum of the R transforms of X and Y in the case that X and Y are free. Now, I did not define what the R transform is, and I will do so briefly right now, but I will not go much into the detail. So first we need to define the Cauchy transform of a probability distribution, which is defined by this expectation here. And the R transform is roughly speaking, its inverse function, inverse under composition. You may think of the Cauchy transform and the R transform as analogs of other transforms you may be familiar with, such as the Fourier transform and the 
moment generating function. Now, similarly to the way that a Fourier transform is well behaved under uh, independent random variables, the R transform is the one which is, as seen is in this theorem, well behaved, assuming that the random variables are free. Even if you did not follow what the definitions of the Cauchy transform and the R transform are, this already gives you a recipe for calculating this probability distribution mu z or mu squared. And the recipe is as follows. We start with the probability distribution mu. We calculate its Cauchy transform from which we calculate its R transform. These are mere cal calculations. Then I can apply Voiculescu's theorem to get the R transform of the free additive convolution of mu with itself. And then I can repeat the calculation in reverse order to calculate the Cauchy transform and then back to the distribution I was looking for. And with this recipe in hand, we're going to go back to talk about random graphs. Recall our setting of a random graph. We had D independent perfect matchings, each with a corresponding probability distribution mu, which is one with probability half and minus one with probability half. For this, I'm going to apply the recipe I just described, just that I'm not going to apply it just two times, but rather d times for the d perfect matchings that I'm adding up. And here I start with calculating, according to the recipe, I start by calculating the Cauchy transform. So you can verify me here or just trust me that it reaches this formula. And I go on to calculate the R transform apply Voiculescu's theorem to get the R transform of the convolution, do some more calculations to eventually reach the probability distribution of the convolution, which is called the Keston-McKay distribution with parameter D. And although this distribution may look a little scary, you may notice that it is supported between minus and plus two square root of d minus one, which is exactly the requirement we had for Ramanujan graphs to match the alon bopana bound. We've started with random graphs. We made a whole detour to define free uh, non-commutative non probability spaces and free random variables to reach the exact same number we were looking for. And to quote three blue, one brown, in this case, if you have a soul, you probably want to know a little more. To conclude, we first need to ask ourselves, what have we just seen? What does all this mean about the spectra of random graphs and about Ramanujan graphs? Also, we may want to know whether there are more graph-related questions to be answered using, using this free additive convolution and the analogous free multiplicative convolution, which I did not discuss here, but it is the analog for the product of free random variables. And as it turns out, there are more graph applications for this theory. You may also want to know what's behind this theory. How do you prove theorems like Voiculescu's theorem I mentioned? And this is a fascinating topic on its own, and it involves looking at probability from a different point of view, in particular through the lens of cumulants instead of moments. And also, surprisingly, it involves a lot of combinatorics. And in particular, we count stuff. And the thing we like counting the most is non-crossing partitions. Briefly put, 
a non-crossing partition for a sequence of elements is a way to partition them into pairs in such a way that if I draw a line between each pair, the lines don't cross. I will conclude here. So thank you very much for watching and feel free to reach out.